Hello, and welcome to Some Like a Classic, a podcast about the movie magic and timeless shows of classic film and television. I'm your host, Tammy Govea, and together we'll revel in old Hollywood nostalgia and delve into the searing reflections of the men and women who shape the cultural landscape through the lens of entertainment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Some Like It Classic. I'm your host, Tammy Govea, and today you may recognize my guest. She is infamous for her spot on TCM's Movies Made Me Do It. She's a cartoonist, illustrator, humorist, writer, and of course, a classic film aficionado and superfan, Mimi Pond. Welcome. Hi, it's nice to be here. It's lovely to have you. Um, I first saw your lovely face and heard your beautiful story on Turner Classic Movies, the spot movies made me do it. Uh, You and your husband, Wayne White, also did a segment, correct? Correct. Yes. I would love to know how did that come to be? Well, uh, I had, uh, we're friends with the um, writer and illustrator, uh, William Joyce, a children's book illustrator. And uh, he was uh, a guest at the TCM Film Festival one, <coughs> Festival one year and invited us to come see him introduce Bambi um, <laughs> with the actual, the, the man who had done the voice of Bambi, who's like now like an 80 year old, a retired Marine. Uh, oh that was God. an interesting story. But I, you know, I, I started like looking wait, wait, around. Wait, wait, a retired Marine was well, a voice? Well, as a child, he was the voice of Bambi. Right, right. You know, but that's fascinating that along his journey, that's what he segued into. That's amazing. He segued into being a Marine. And then when he retired from the Marines, he, um, he uh, worked for different charities. Um, and it was like really a, a tireless go-getter and, and uh, you know, uh, beating the drum for various charities and very enthusiastic. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he was a very nice man. Anyway, I'm looking around the film festival. And because I'm a cartoonist, I'm thinking, you know, is this, does this have the potential to be the subject of a cartoon? And obviously to me it did at first, I, it seemed to me at first to be not unlike Comic Con, which I'm from San Diego and I started going to Comic Con when I was 12 years old. And, um, uh, you know, there are not, there was like, there's a segment of the, the people that attend, um, the TCM Film Festival who like to dress up in period clothes, vintage clothes and stuff. But the more time I spent the, there, the more I realized um, that the, the uh, for the most part, the, um, um, what do they call it? Uh, 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 what do they uh, call it when it's someone stuck in adolescence? Um, um, that, pre, pre, Oh, what was the? It was the name of a sitcom, um, Arrested Development. Arrested okay. Development. Okay. There you go. So there was a. I, I thought, is, do we have the same Arrested Development situation going on here that we do at Comic Con, where you've got like mouth breathing nerds, you know, ages five to to eighty five, walking around in Star Wars costumes, <laughs> Star Trek costumes, and you know that whole thing. And I'm like. The more I talk to people there, the more I realize that no, really, these people are like just passionate film buffs from, I mean, they they come like from every walk of life. Some of them are serious film scholars and academics, and some of them are just people whose hobby is talking about uh, classic films. And for a lot of, they, they come together, they have this real community. They come there every year and they, they, they've made friends over the years and they see the same people. And it's like, when you don't live in LA or, or New York, um, you don't necessarily have other people to talk to about old movies. Like they don't, here in LA, like your, your Uber driver, you know, knows who like, you know, uh, you know, the, can, can, you know, name off the names of, of, you know, rattle off the names of like, you know, five different 
character actors from the from the 1930s for you. I mean, that's how we roll here. And yeah. um, I've discovered in visiting different parts of the country that like a lot of people don't have any kind of interest in old movies. And it's just, you know, it's like your mind is blown. You're like, what? You've never heard of Busby Berkeley? <laughs> I mean, these are like, you know, I'm not talking, saying they're stupid. Like, I, these are like people with college educations and stuff, but they just don't have that, that thing for movies that, that we have here. So these people, they, they, it's like, they, this is their tribe. They've all come together. And I found I was like, this was more my tribe than anyone at Comic-Con was ever. And I'm, you know, I'm a, a big comics nerd, but I'm also, you know, really attached to old movies. And um, it, it's a great, great group of people. They're just um, really interesting. So, because this long answer to a short question, I I pitched the idea of doing a cartoon to the New Yorker, and they said, you know, great, do it. I mean, this was for their for their online edition because obviously this would take up way too much real estate. And it's, um, I um, I went to, I, through Bill Joyce, I got in touch with someone at TCM and asked them if I could come, you know, and get a guest pass and be there and do that. And they said, yes. Oh, that's fantastic. And then, and then I, you know, I got there and got to know everyone and they just could not have been nicer. They're just this, like the most genuine, sweet, normal, nice people. Like they're not at all corporate. They're just fantastic. And they treat all their fans really, really well. And, it, you know, it was just, really, really fun to be there and and to um, you can still go to the newyorker.com and access the the cartoon. I think it's called Ready for Ready for a Close Up. But yes. it's it's the contrast between all these these rabid film buffs inside the the um, uh, Roosevelt Hotel and at the the man's the the Chinese theater across the street. Um, and and then outside the theater on Hollywood Boulevard are all these you know these crass tourists who <laughs> yeah. are there, but it's like it's like they've never figured out what to do with the tourist in Hollywood. Like they you know you could go on a Star Tours bus tour, or they like look around, but there's no there's no like except for them going to like Universal Studios, there's no there there for them. Like there's no way to see what how it really works. And finally now the Academy is opening their museum soon. I know, it opens up I mean, and it's like, why didn't this happen 50 years ago? I know. You know, just to educate the public about film in so many ways when like, obviously people love old movies, but they get here and they just dick around on Hollywood Boulevard and buy a bunch of crappy souvenirs and, and get their pictures taken with, with um, off costumed costumed people yeah. who are really <laughs> sketchy, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and even, even the, the Kodak theater, you know, just, it's and I think mall. you mentioned it. It's in a mall. It's in a mall. It's like, really? You're, you're there's a million beautiful historical places here in Los Angeles that that the Oscars could be held. Go back to the Biltmore Hotel, and do yeah, it. it doesn't need to be in this you know ten thousand seat theater. It could be a much more intimate experience, which I think would lend itself to it. Well, I mean, and I guess that's kind of what it was, you know, this year with the uh, with Union Station. Um, but Although even then, that, they could have done so much more with that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they could have shown the films that were actually filmed at Union Station. There's a ton of movies that were actually yeah. filmed there. Yeah. None of the history was really delved into. No, uh, no. I mean, I just, I, I really couldn't get into watching it. I kind of just abandoned it about an hour into it. And I thought I thought they were going to do it like they did the Democratic National Convention, which was just a, a masterwork in using uh, you know different locations all over the country to like make you feel like you're part of a whole. And I, you know that was like really emotional for me to feel yeah. like all these people like they're in their front these delegates they're in their front yards with signs with their kids, and it just felt so intimate and like this is America and. Um, they, I just thought they dropped the ball with with the awards this year. Um, but anyway, getting back to so so I mean there was just a you know a 
a gold mine of comic opportunities at the at the film festival to you know to study all this stuff and it was just really fun and uh then i you know i became became friends with with uh Katie Daniels, who's their their um, head of their graphic design department, and um, she she's the one that contacted us about doing these spots, and we were like, yeah, it's such a great concept. So they sent us, you know, like ring lights and and a fancy camera to attach to the laptop and special microphone and all this stuff and <laughs> and you know like made us work the lights just the right way so that the ring light wasn't bouncing off of my glasses and, <laughs> um, and yeah they were great did it take long for you to come up with exactly what you wanted to say because when you're talking about how films influenced you it's a personal experience you know, I had plenty of answers right away because it's just so much a part of me. You know, it's it's uh, really the whole um, thing about about imagining that the bars and the crummy bars in the neighborhood I grew up in were like actually, you know, inside they just expanded exponentially and became like fabulous nightclubs <laughs> with tears and banquettes and little lights and a bandstand and an orchestra and glamorous girls dancing and stuff. It was like, that's just from watching Busby Berkeley movies. And oh, S Strike Up the Band was on last night. And, oh. and um, it, it's, it's directed by Busby Berkeley. I think it's from 1940. And it's, it's Mickey Rooney and, and Judy. Um, Judy Garland. And um, it's kind of like Busby Berkeley light. You know, it's like you could see where he like probably wanted to build these immense sets and just do stuff. But instead you could, you could still see all the Busby Berkeley and the camera angles and the way he shot orchestras and people dancing and stuff. So it really, um, it's a pretty dopey movie, but just visually it really it's, held our absolutely. interest. Absolutely. I mean, you, you appreciate it for the spectacle and the feat, the magnitude of, you know, the scale of it is yeah. astounding. Yeah, Absolutely it's like, astounding. yeah. I mean, it's basically kind of just like an Andy Hardy movie, but it's shot by Busby Berkeley. <laughs> the stories don't change. Anything with Mickey yeah, and Judy, the story never changes. <laughs> it's like, come on, kids. <laughs> Talk a little bit about you know, growing up and, and how, the, how the films activated your imagination? Oh, well, I mean, there's, there's so many great old movies out there. Um, and then also um, my, my mother, um, we, I, I grew up in San Diego. My parents were like, you know, working class people who were like autodidactic. So we always went to the library every two weeks. And when they, when they had the file cards. Oh yeah, yeah. Like sure. you'd open up the drawer, you'd go through the file. I miss yeah, those days. <laughs> all that. I mean, it was like, that's like what we did instead of church, like every two weeks, go, go to the library. Um, and besides that, um, the only th the only way I knew at all that there is something called summer camp existed was by Alan Sherman records and reading mad magazine because you know it just it didn't exist in my world and instead of going to summer school my mother sent us to I mean instead of going to summer camp we went to summer school because it was fr the, the local public schools had like enrichment classes in the summer so from the time I was like in third grade till I finished high school I was in summer school and then besides that um, the, her other babysitter was um, the movies there and the, they had the local theater had like you know a, a, a subscription thing where you you know you bought a huge roll of tickets and you could go to the movie like you'd get dropped off at like 10 30 and your mother would pick you up at like 4 30. <laughs> So awesome. And so we saw all these these odd movies, and then besides that, um, you know, she was she was, you know, trying to get us out of her hair. And I had an older brother who somehow always got to pick the movie, and that, those were all James Bond movies, which you know, I don't <laughs> recommend. That's good taste. I don't That's recommend. Taste. No, I don't recommend them for you know like nine year old girls to see. You're like, wait, this is what women are supposed to act like. You're either like a you know you're like. A, a floozy and and James Bond is gonna you know throw a, a 
a, an electric heater in the in the bathtub while you're taking a bath <laughs> you're a bad person. I mean, I got a lot of mixed messages there. And like, you know, what exactly do I get to do in this scenario? Really nothing except sit around and look sexy. Really? That's that's going to be it for me? <laughs> and so, but besides, and then for some weird reason, uh, when I was about 12 or 13, I got to see, I think I was 13, it was summer, and we got sent off, packed off to see The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Uh, and that movie blew my mind because it had girls at its center. And how many movies back then had back then, you know, yeah. adolescent girls at their centers? Hardly any. There's that and, and um, um, The World of Henry Orient, which is just a, a work of genius. And even National uh, Velvet. And National Velvet. I just yeah. recently, I will admit, I saw that for the first time on TCM maybe three weeks ago and oh. I just loved it. Oh my God. Well, the oh. scene where, where, you know, her mother had been a, a, a professional swimmer. She'd swum the English channel. And, yeah. and there's a scene where she like tells her that she wants her to, to go after her dreams. And it's just like, you never see that in those movies. I never saw that. And it was like, you know, it's just, I, and so the prime of Miss Jean Brody was was like really fascinating to me and I just totally totally got into it and I still love that movie so um I mean, it, it, partly because the the main character is this this girl who is like figuring out that Miss Brody is like really on the wrong side of the whole <laughs> argument <laughs> And then she actually encourages one of her students to, to go off and fight for Franco. And then the, the student gets blown up. <laughs> I remember seeing that film and was going, what am I watching? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and, then, and then she winds up sleeping with the art teacher. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, and, and um, of course, I'm blanking on her name. Um, Miss Jean Brody is Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith. And she's just spectacular in it. Always. My gales. <laughs> <laughs> I am in my prime. <laughs> what does that even mean? Exactly. <laughs> you know, one of the things you mentioned um, when you were covering the, the festival, the film festival, uh, you said, with our 60-inch screens at home and our phones and tablets, we sometimes forget the communion of the theater-going experience. It's like church without the damnation. And it really touched on a subject that I'm emotional about, and that is the experience of going to the movie theaters. You know, with the onset of Netflix and all this digital content, uh, I really started to get worried about that yeah. world and that experience. What are your thoughts on it? Well, yeah, there's nothing like going to the movies. I mean, they're really, especially with uh, an audience as committed as the, the, uh, the audiences at the, the TCM Film Festival. My husband has gotten phobic about going to the movies because people have, they, they make so much noise and it really irritates him. And it is, you know, like they're checking their phones or they're like crinkling their, their candy wrappers or they're just talking, you know, like it, uh, once we went to the, the movie theater and, and the opening, like the first three minutes were, were without dialogue. It was all action. And this woman in front of us was like yammering away. And I finally just yelled at her to shut up. She says, there's no talking yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that's the other thing is people have gotten so used to thinking that they're in their living rooms. Exactly. Yeah. There's no, there's no, you know, you likened it to church. There's no reverence. Yeah. For the experience anymore. Yeah. And actually, I always prefer going to church when there's nobody there. I like the solitude of it and the quiet of it. And I like going to the movies when there's not a lot of people there. Yeah. You yeah. know, I always used to go in, in, you know, in the matinees, like in the early afternoons when there wasn't a lot of people there. And as, as artists, you know, 
what do we want to do in the middle of the afternoon when we're not working? Well, let's go to the movies. It was a perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember I, um, I was pregnant with my daughter when I went to see the, the movie um, Party Girl with Parker Posey, which is a great movie. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a poem to the, Desmi, the Dewey Decimal System. It's, a, it, it's a, an homage to librarians. <laughs> it's a great little movie. And Does she play a so librarian? Yeah, what? Okay. Does she play a librarian? Well, she plays a party girl who um, li lives in New York and is like, uh, she gets thrown in jail because she has a rent party. So that she, you know, she has a party and charges admission so that she can pay her rent. <laughs> oh my and, God, I and love she's, it. <laughs> she's, um, she also collects um, uh, designer, cl like uh, vintage clothes and designer clothes. And she's got them really well organized. Um, and, and, um, her parents are dead and she has a guardian. I mean, she's, she's like in her twenties, but she has a, a guardian who's a librarian who pays her bail and then tells her that she's got to work off the, what she owes her by working in the library. And she, she's finally introduced to the library and she likes the whole, she likes the organization of it. <laughs> and she decides to, to go to school and become a librarian. And, um, you know, that's the um, that's the basic story of it. But also, she falls in love with a a, a Lebanese guy who ha has a falafel cart, and um, he he tells her that he's trying to you know get his uh, green card, but he doesn't know how to do it. And she takes him to the library and shows him how to research doing that. And this is like this would have been like uh, night spring of like 1995 so okay. it's like just pre-internet i mean yeah pretty much pre-internet um and and they fall in love and and also because i was pregnant i was hungry all the time so i <laughs> every time i would like i would go to the um what's that theater at at sunset in la cienega um i can see it in my brain yeah it's changed names a couple of days. yeah now it's like sundance cinema anyway that's where it was playing and I, I went to see it three times because i wanted to study it but every time on the way home i would have to stop at zanku chicken and get a falafel sandwich <laughs> what did you want to study about it what was it about the film just the script i you know because i'm 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 also you know trying to write screenplays and stuff and i just like i, I like the way that it was the whole uh way it was set up and everything and it was and it's also very funny and parker posey is great in it she's always brilliant i mean she's miss indie film queen yeah but a lot you know often her films to me read almost like a play because really the the story is about the conversations that are are being had as opposed to and it's probably why i love classic films so much as opposed to the special effects and yeah you know it's about the relationships yeah it's about the relationships you know one thing you had mentioned um about films inspiring you and going back to see that three times is so great you had mentioned that one of your favorite directors is michael powell and when you mentioned his name I was like michael powell have I seen anything he's done? And when I read through his, his work, it's like, oh, that's Michael Powell. Oh, that's Michael Powell. Yeah, a, a, a lot of his movies feature really strong women characters who, who have very definite ideas of, of who they are and, they're, and they, they wind up wildly conflicted and, and have to figure out their way out of things. Like, the Red Shoes is just gorgeously shot. And it's, so beautiful. And it's also sort of, you know, of course, of its time, um, this, this young ballerina uh, has the opportunity uh, to become a, a ballet star with this very controlling impresario. And then she's in love with this composer and um, wants to get married. And, and she's forced to essentially uh, she's forced to choose between uh, either being a, a wife or, or being a ballerina and she can't even like her, it's like her brain just explodes. I mean, I don't want to give away the ending for anyone who hasn't seen it, but um, it's, it's, um, 
it's just incredible. And Leonid Massine uh, dances opposite her and he was dancing with Nijinsky in the 20s. He was in his 50s when he made this movie and it's just amazing. Wasn't she also a professional ballerina in real life? Yeah, she more yeah. sure was actually a she, and an excellent actress too. But it's it's very dramatic and, and extremely fraught. And you're like, you know, from our point of view, you're like, what? You can't do both? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just just visually, it's just a delight. And then one of my most favorite movies is is this movie he made called I Know Where I'm Going. Um, and it's a, a young woman, it's like just post-war Britain, and this <clears throat> young career gal is, is um, you know, she, she's landed a real cat. She's, she's got this older industrialist who wants to marry her, and she's, her father is a, you know, a, a middle-class bank clerk, and she meets him for a drink and says, yes, she's leaving on the train to go to Scotland, uh, her her fiance has rented this castle on an island off the, in the in the Hebrides, and that's where they're going to get married, and everything's going to be great, and everything's <laughs> going just exactly the way she wants. It's all good. She's going to have all this money. It's going to be great. And she gets on the first of all, she gets on the train, and and it's an overnight sleeper train, and and she has this dream, uh, and it's she's dreaming that the pl that the the hills are plaid. And it's just, it's just really cartoonish. It just appeals to every, every like cartoon instinct I have. It's like, ooh. And then she gets, she gets to Scotland and um, it turns out that she, she is taken by ferry to like one island, but then the island where she's getting married is just like, she can see it. It's like a mile away, but the, the the weather's bad and no one will take her over there because there's a famous whirlpool uh, nearby. And when the weather's bad, nobody is gonna take her to this island. So she's gotta wait it out until the weather clears. And she gets to know these people on the island, including this handsome young naval officer who's you know home on leave, who's very handsome. And um, she's, she's trying to get through to the island and she, he takes her to a payphone that's by a roaring waterfall. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and she just can't seem to get, you know, make any contact with, with the island and the, the fiance and everything. And, and um, you know, she meets these people on this island who are like, no one has much money, but they all seem pretty happy and they don't seem to be too worried about it. And there's this really fascinating woman whose name is Katrina. Katrina, who's like lives with these Irish wolfhounds and just kind of lounges around in a really sexy way. How fabulous. <laughs> and she's like starts to get like, you know, and then she gets taken to like a, a party, a Scottish party where everyone's dancing wildly to Scottish reels and stuff. And and it just like opens up her world. And and of course, nothing turns out the way she thinks it's going to. Which is always uh it's a nice little twist. Yeah. I haven't seen that, so. And then uh, Black Narcissus is about, yes. you know, uh, like, what is, sex crazed nuns. <laughs> the whole premise of that is, I, I would love to have been in the room where, when they pitched it. <laughs> so I got this story about this convent of nuns who, well, just like you said, <laughs> Right, sex crazed, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. That's probably how people responded. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. That sounds fun. Let's do it. <laughs> well, that's good. British. That's the British. And the cast too. is amazing. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I don't think he ever would have. I, I don't know if he ever made any quote unquote Hollywood films, Michael Powell. But, you know, that stuff just doesn't wash over here. <laughs> like Abby Fab, you know? Right. I, it doesn't translate, unfortunately. The, uh, the subject matter or the humor in particular, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, and yet, he's influenced Scorsese and Coppola and, you know, American oh, and directors a, for, for generations. In a, in a, in a brief... Uh, scene in I Know Where I'm Going, 
the child actress Petula Clark is in it briefly. <sighs> Da, 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 <laughs> downtown. She plays a, 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 a snooty little girl with glasses and riding breeches who quit, who's, who's asking way too many questions of the main character. <laughs> <laughs> I can picture it. I can completely picture it. <laughs> you know, one thing that I had mentioned that I wanted to talk about because I find the uh, organization fascinating and that's the nantucket project mm -hmm. um they're going to be celebrating their 10th year this year i'm not exactly sure how they're going to do it because i think it's in september yeah that they'll be doing it and we'll kind of see how with COVID and everything you know how they'll be rolling it out however um your husband and yourself were part of the the weekend mm -hmm. um, back in 2016 um, your husband uh, was a speaker? He was a speaker, and he also uh, created an incredible cardboard whale parade um, through the streets of Nantucket with a lot of, a lot of uh, volunteers. And they, they had, they, he built a giant cardboard whale um, that spouted water. And, and then um, <clears throat> there were, and he made big, uh, like, uh, whaling sailors' heads, cardboard heads, <clears throat> and, and, recruited local people to, to be those characters. And why, they, they showed up for the parade and suddenly they all had, had striped t-shirts. And I said, how'd you find so many striped t-shirts? I said, it's Nantucket, duh. Oh yeah, nautical land, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Talk and a little I, bit about what, what is the Nantucket project? I mean, I love the whole concept of it. Well, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's a, like a TED talk for really rich people. <laughs> Yeah, I was looking at the ticket prices. Money to go there. <laughs> so yeah, I mean they had, you know, they had like Deepak Chopra was there when when we were there. Everyone agreed he was kind of an a hole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. <laughs> and who else? Um, I've forgotten. I mean, it was like, you know, kind of heady. All these these big wigs were there. And um I was really just a drag along. So I was got to listen to all the, the speakers and it was, you know, it was great. Well, I know you created um, a number of, of sketches. Of yeah, well, you know, I was there, the I had a sketch, sketchbook. I thought I might, I just started drawing and they liked them and, and used them. So They're beautiful. You know. There was one in particular, and I think it was of Liz Murphy or Murray, Liz Murray. Um, and, and you write the quote that she had said, do the next right thing. Synonism is the atrophy of imagination. And I love that. And I, especially when I was thinking about you, how as an artist, fighting that atrophy is pivotal. Yeah. And you fight that atrophy by staying inspired. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> what I've found is like, if you're sitting at your desk and there's a pencil nearby and a piece of paper, there's more likely that you're going to start drawing than if you're like, curled up in another corner of the house looking at your phone. <laughs> yeah. So I try to like just sit myself at my desk as often as I can. Um, a big source of inspiration for me um, with the book I'm working on now <clears throat> is um, Pinterest because there's just so many images there of just about everything you could imagine. Um, so I've, I've made a, a private Pinterest board for myself for this project that's just tons and tons of images to to look through to get ideas from so um that's been really helpful also the fact that you know i'm stuck at home and i can't actually leave the house <laughs> um you know it's more likely that you're going to get work done if you can't leave <laughs> yeah so it's been you know it's for my husband and myself it's it's actually we've had a very productive year isn't that interesting? I think, I think if you're an artist, um, I mean, unless, unless you're, no, even if you're a musician, I mean, granted, you can't go out there and tour this past year, but, but as an artist, we found ways to stay creative and, and to find like-minded folk who are looking to think outside of the box again. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and it's you know, I, it's also important to surround yourself with people who are going to support what you do, yeah. and and not with people who are going, "What do you want to do that for? That's dumb." Yeah, I learned that lesson a long time ago. Yeah, you you can gauge that in the first thirty seconds or one minute of meeting someone whether or not they're going to be a positive yeah. influence, and doesn't necessarily mean they're going to agree with you on everything. But there's no. just an innate sense of, okay, here's, here's somebody who gets it and yeah. is going gonna, is gonna to be supportive. Yeah. I mean, in, in my husband and I talk about this often in our lives as artists. Um, there, are, <clears throat> there are people who, are, who lead, you know, they just have regular jobs and they go to work and they, they come home and they look forward to retirement or they're going on a cruise or whatever. And they're they're threatened by the fact that you get to do what you want every single day. You know, it pisses them off. <laughs> and you know, like you don't really need those people in your life. It's like I um <laughs> I I did a cartoon, I interviewed Phyllis Diller about six months before she died. How fabulous. It was, we met her at a book signing of hers. Was it for a uh, uh, like, like a, like a like lampshade, lampshade in a whorehouse. Yes. Which is a really inspiring book. I it was, was really wonderful. Amazed by that. Her whole story is just astonishing. The fact that she's like 35, she's got five kids, she's got a deadbeat husband, she's working, writing ad copy. Her husband says, Hey, you're funny, you should do that new thing that people are doing. That's like at the Purple Onion in San Francisco, you should do that. And she's like, really? And then like she hooks up with her gay and he like helps her put her act together. And, and the, you know, she, she did it. And it's just incredible. And, um, she, you know, she was retired when I met her, she had been retired from, from doing stand up, and she was, she was uh, making art full time. And she would open her house every few months for like a, an art sale and you know like oh whatever gosh. was on the walls you could buy it was like picasso's garage sale and i uh actually uh knew somebody who had had been to one of them and got the name of her assistant and just kept bothering her until she let me come over and do this you know interview and she's like okay you've got a half an hour and i wound up being there for over an hour and i was like with her in her little studio in her beautiful house in brentwood which is mm. really amazing she's got a whole shrine to bob hope who basically discovered her but she had like a a, a bronze bust of him and a full-length oil portrait of him <laughs> wow but, uh, but if you watch her act you realize it's all it's just totally he's her total uh template i mean her whole her whole delivery is so much like his um but i <clears throat> i i kept trying to ask her if like because she didn't she never said anything about it in the book but you know being a woman in comedy in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s i and know the 90s yeah is a rough road to hoe and she would not cop to anyone being mean to her except i think she said paul lind <laughs> but um but also she said you know but i i made i i was like a clown i wore gloves and and funny shoes and a funny dress and I, you know and it had a wig like a clown so she like had desexualized herself so she yeah. wasn't a threat the way joan rivers probably would have been right you know, I who, i'm sure exactly had who i was thinking of stories galore um <clears throat> but but anyway at the end of, of our time together, she said, you know, I feel sorry for people who, you know, we're lucky, no, she, she said, we're lucky to do what we do. I said, I know, I feel sorry for people who have to work just regular jobs. And I couldn't put this in the cartoon because it was just a little too much. But she said, it's their own fault. <laughs> well, you know, everybody makes choices for yeah. whatever reasons. And, you know, my mother, one of my mother's favorite sayings was to each their own, to each their own. But, you know, if someone's walking around miserable and unhappy and, 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 and projectile vomiting onto other people, that's when I take an issue. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, everyone's made their choices for the life that they're leading. If you're not happy with it, make different choices. I'm not, I don't mean to sound flippant because it, it's, it's, 
not as easy as it sounds, clearly. No, no, it's not. But at the end of the day, you know, life is short. Life is short. And it's never, ever, I honestly believe this, it's never, ever too late to make different choices for yourself. Yeah, it really isn't. I mean, I, I'm just, um, I've been discovering among the artists that I have known for years and years, and we're, you know, people like me that were in our 60s, it's like, we're just now coming into our own. Mm. It's like, it's taken us this long to like figure it out and we're just getting better. We're just kind of getting up to speed now. And it's exciting. You know, and it's like, you know, I'm never going to retire. What's I mean, the, I'm just yeah. getting better. I'm just getting started. Yeah, I agree. And then I, I, you know, I started hosting and interviewing later in life. I mean, and this goes back to allowing yourself to be inspired and listening to that voice or voices. Yeah right? Yeah. That, that are always accessible to you. Yes. Yes, very much so. Um, th that's been happening for me a lot with working on the book I'm working on, which is about uh, the, the Mitford sisters who are six I want six you to talk about English. that. <laughs> There's six uh, aristocratic sisters born between 1904 and 19. Who uh, were basically raised? They never believed in educating girls, so they just were educated at home, and <clears throat> they all went off and did a whole bunch of stuff they probably shouldn't have done. But it was like no one told them they couldn't do that. I think um, I think part of it is the entitlement of the upper classes, but also they could have just as easily have fallen by the wayside and been like gotten married and had children, but. The important thing is because they didn't go to school, they weren't socialized and, right. and, and it, told that girls don't do this and they don't do that. And like, I mean, there's like so much shit. You're just swimming in it as a woman all the time being told what you can and cannot do that, you know, it's a wonder that any of us <laughs> do anything because there's like, you can't do this and you can't do that. And basically, oh, all women are whores. Right. Or, you know, that it's or you're message. institutionalized. You know, you're yeah, institutionalized, you're given lobotomies, you're given, you know, electric shock treatment. Um, there's all this, like you said, these stigmas that are put on you. And yeah. No, I mean, you can't win. I mean, society just is, is it, just as we are inherently racist, we are also inherently misogynistic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that wave will come eventually of m that awareness. Uh, I don't know if we'll see it in our lifetime, maybe next lifetime, the next generation. <laughs> you know, there'll be some, some changes. I mean, there's, there's changes, and especially if you're talking about the entertainment industry and women in the entertainment industry, you know, there, there's, there's little tiny steps that are, are, are happening. You know, right. Particularly behind the camera. You know, I love seeing, you know, more female directors and, you know, more yeah. women and, in you know, the writer's you, room. Even if Nomadland wasn't, I mean, there's a lot of people who didn't like Nomadland. I haven't seen it. But even if it wasn't the world's best film, uh, it's okay for a woman to make a mediocre film just as men have made mediocre to shitty films for years and years and years. And been forever. acknowledged for it and praised for it and paid yeah. gazillions of dollars for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because how many times have we, you know, seen a, a movie win Best Picture where you're like, are you kidding me? Kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, to your point, women and whatever they produce artistically, there is that pedestal. Yeah. I there mean, is that another, blasted okay, pedestal. Another favorite, favorite, favorite movie of mine is, is uh, A New Leaf. Um, which was directed by Elaine May, and and she basically um, the movie was taken away from her and and recut, and she kind of she wanted her name taken off of it, but they they didn't. But I still think it's a great movie. I but um, it's it. Have you ever seen it? It's Walter Matthau, and no. uh, and she's in it, and and uh, he's he's this um, aging. Pl uh, uh, trust fund guy who's who's uh, he's 
he's like, his, I think he's like in his mid thirties and his accountant has just told him you've run through all your money. He's like, well, let's just write another check. I'm like, no, you don't get it. <laughs> you don't have any money. And, <laughs> and it's like, oh, and he's, there's a scene of him driving his Jaguar down Park Avenue crying. <laughs> and he decides he's just going to have to marry some rich woman. Wow. <laughs> And, and he, and it's like the, the process of him dating and rejecting these various women. And he finally um, comes up, uh, stumbles upon Elaine May, who's a, an, uh, an heiress and a um, um, plant scientist, like a botanist. Um, and, and um, she's a, just a complete nerd and <laughs> unattractive and he's just like gritting his teeth and deciding like okay i got to do it and and um it's just screamingly funny it's just brilliant and uh, you know like elaine may was made the example after that they they she was like the one woman they let direct a film she blew it so then like no more women could direct movies after that for years and years yeah it you know, amazing. it's interesting when you look at the history of film making. Women were at the forefront from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, and they then, were right up there because in the big, you know, it was all like fluid in the beginning, like the internet. There were no rules, and you could do anything. And women were like getting in there like crazy. And then something happened. Some say it was World War II, and that changed things uh, because making money became the most important thing and apparently men knew how to do that. I don't know. I don't know exactly what happened historically to change things. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. It was, I mean, it was still in the, in the silent era where it started to change. Um, I think in the twenties, but before that there were like so many uh, pioneer women and then, you know, um, Mary Pickford had her own production company. Oh my gosh, yeah. I know. And the uh, UA, that was Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford yeah. and Douglas Fairbanks. And uh, it still breaks my heart that they raised Pickfair. That it's not, no longer there. Along with <clears throat> so much other erased history. I know. And, you know, to your point earlier, there's so much of it here in LA that's not protected. Yeah, and there's a lot of it that's hidden. Yeah, I think there's a series out there called Hidden LA. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and um, speaking of the, um, I was just visiting a friend of mine the other day who lives uh, in Hollywood, off of like near uh, Santa Monica and Western. Mm -hmm. But there's still so many of those little apartment courts. Those bungalow. Yeah, yeah. yeah like Day of the Locust. Yes. You, yeah. Yes. There's yes. so many of them, and and it's they should be documented more. I mean, there were a lot of them in San Diego too when I was growing up, and I was always enchanted by them because it was like, oh, your own little house. <laughs> I would love for you to talk too about, um, because I know the inspiration for these also came from your experiences and classic film and its influence, but your uh, graphic memoir from 2014, Over Easy, mm -hmm. and then its sequel in 2017, yes. The Customer is Always Wrong, which I love the title of. So speak a little bit about those two projects. Well, I was a waitress in Oakland in the late 70s. I had gone to art school um, for three years at California College of Arts and Crafts. And <clears throat> in the fourth year, they I don't, they decided not to give me any more money. And I wasn't about to take out, you know, more, more loans. And I was like, I'd already done two years of community college before that. And I was like, you know, I'm kind of done with this. <laughs> and I walked down the street to this restaurant in Oakland called Mama's Royal Cafe. And I... Um, tried to put in a job application and they told me, well, oh, you have to talk to the manager. And he's this, this, um, he was like everyone's groovy beatnik dad. He was a, a guy in his mid to late thirties who had, was a, a poet and a Latin scholar, uh, wow. you know, and um, he'd, he's, everyone who applied for a job, he'd say, tell me a joke or a dream. Ooh, love that. So, so uh, I told him a dirty joke and got the job. And, <laughs> Do you and, remember the joke? 
<laughs> yeah, but I don't want to repeat it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I don't think I could have worked anywhere else because he was such an, an enabler of creative people. You know, a lot of people from my art school who, you know, like worked there and musicians and punks. And it was like, it was just at the changing of the guard when, when hippiedom uh, merged into punk, thank God. <laughs> Cause I was like really sick of hippies by that point. <laughs> and, and it was a whole new energy and a whole new thing. And, and, um, a lot of sex, drugs and rock and roll and eggs. And, <laughs> eggs. and, uh, it was, it was just a really fun place to work until one day when it just wasn't fun anymore. Like yeah. it was like, there had like, you know, that kind of drug use just to, there's a tipping point and that it all kind of slides, falls off the cliff. And so that's kind of what the book is about. I mean, I, it was not like, I wasn't personally involved in the, in the, the drug part because I was like basically a little goody two shoes. And also, I, I mean, I, I, I was like, I'm going to work at this restaurant. I'm going to save my money. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to be a cartoonist. And I like had that goal. And, you know, there's a lot of young people who don't have those kind of goals that get caught up in, stuff and then they wind up like disappearing down rabbit holes for years and years and then one day they they're either dead or they pop up again and you go oh my god <laughs> they're like yeah that was terrible but wasn't it fun <laughs> if you can remember it <laughs> it is i mean people who were like they had become hardcore heroin addicts like mm. and went through hell and came really like late you know years later when I, and I talked to many many of them to get their stories to to make this book and they're like yeah but wasn't it fun <laughs> so these books it have, was, have I mean, become really successful what do you think it is that resonates i'm sorry what, what's become successful over easy and oh. and the customer is always wrong oh. I, you know, it's a it's a real look at a particular time and place, and it's also um, working in a restaurant is is a uh, kind of a really universal experience. A lot of people have experienced that same kind of milieu. It's like all mm. you know, wild and loose. I mean, it used to be a lot more wild and loosey goosey. Now, you know, with like everything's on the computer and everything's tabulated and clocked in and clocked out and every order, you know, exactly. I mean, back then we're like, you know, going in the walk-in and just digging into the ice cream. <laughs> 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 and nobody was looking. <laughs> also sex in the walk-in, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. O Oakland, I just love Oakland. And I, it's the whole, both of those books are for me like a love letter to Oakland because it was such an unusual, un, undiscovered place. Mm. It was like a, a, a diamond in the rough. You know, it, it was, it had everything San Francisco had and, you know, at, at you know, half the rent. Yeah. I mean, even then, like, you know, people said, oh, we're going to the city tonight, like, because Oakland wasn't a city. San Francisco was the city, you know, but like, if you went to San Francisco, then you had to like, you had to find a place to park, first of all. And then, you know, everything it cost was a whole expensive. lot. More. Yeah. And meanwhile, like, I was renting an entire house for $300 a month. Oh my God. That's amazing. I mean, I remember when I first moved to LA. I shared an apartment. It was a two. It was on Melrose and La Cienega, mm. and two bedroom, two bath, for six hundred bucks. Yeah, it's like, oh, what happened? Yeah, I don't know. What I mean, I guess, uh, and and New York too. I mean, I was in New York in the eighties, and now everyone's like, oh, New York in the eighties was it just awesome? We're like. I don't know. We were just kind of, you know, living our lives. It wasn't like it was, it didn't seem glamorous at the time. I mean, I was walking down Avenue A one day and I saw this woman followed by this big beefy guy. And I was like, how is that? And I'm like, I woke up at 3 a.m. going, oh, that was Madonna. Oh, <laughs> with the bodyguard. <laughs> with the security guard? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, and my husband actually saw her perform at Danceteria before she was anybody. She had like a, 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 a tape track and a couple of, of Puerto Rican go-go boy dancers with her. 
and and was like just trying to sing and everyone was like ah she's nothing <laughs> oh my gosh and then she went on to american and bandstand and when dick clark asked her you know what do you want to be what do you want to do when you grow up and she's like rule the world and that's and what I she, guess did. she did and that's what she did <laughs> Where can... Hey, that bitch stole my look. I mean, I was wearing, there was, I had a look with a lot of necklaces and stuff and, and a big bow in my hair. That bitch stole my look. I was, swear it a to lace, God. was it a yeah. lace bow? Yes. <gasps> I did like a chiffon. I had like an old chiffon uh, scarf that I tied up in a big bow on top of my head because I had plenty of style. I was working <laughs> it. And I, she definitely stole that. That's just rude. Swear to God. <laughs> Cindy Lauper would probably agree with you. Yes. <laughs> if you could recommend two films to folks, I mean, you've already recommended quite a few. Gosh. But if you could recommend two films, um, what would they be? Well, the producers is a perfect little movie. And also, um, um, why can't I, John Waters, um, Hairspray. Hairspray? Hairspray and, and the producers. Okay. The original Hairspray, not the horrible musical. No, no, you know, no John no. Waters for years, he's like, you know, um, Everybody, you know, brags about the, how they don't want to sell out. I said, I'd like to sell out, but nobody's asking me. And I, <laughs> they finally asked him and he did it, you know, so. I love it. Can't blame him. But Not at all. Original Hairspray and, and uh, the producers, which I saw when I was 12. And it's still just as funny to me now as when I was 12. What was so funny? Uh, you know, Gene Wilder, uh, my... My blue blanket, my blue blanket. <laughs> Look at this. I'm wearing a cardboard belt. <laughs> I just love how those moments stick with you. Oh, yeah. That's the beauty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Where can people find you on the socials? Where can they find your work? Well, I'm on Instagram on uh, Mimi Pond Over Easy, and I'm um, just as myself on Facebook, and I'm not really on Twitter that much. I haven't quite figured out. You how that don't worry works. about it. <laughs> really do it for me. And but my Pinterest board is secret. You can't see that. Now I'm intrigued. <laughs> And so if, if well, I just, people... it's just like, I'm, I just collect these, I mean, it's, it's reference material for myself and I, I really don't want to deal with having to explain to anyone what I'm doing with it. So it's just like a, a, a really handy, uh, you know, uh, illustrators and cartoonists used to have um, picture files and you could go to the library, the libraries had picture files of yeah. images. You have to like, oh, I need to, to draw a koala bear. I have to go to the library and, and look in their picture file and see what koala bears look like. And now it's like the internet is our picture file. It's so great. It's it so is great true. for that. It is. It's amazing. Because having that visual is imperative. It really just starts the, the synapses like in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your love of classic film. Um, oh, it's my pleasure. Sharing the inspiration. I could talk about movies all day. I know, I could too, which is, you know, maybe we'll, we should do a series. You know, I keep thinking about all those uh, hidden places in LA. Yeah. That would be fun. That would be fun to do. Fun. That would be fun. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here at Some Like It Classic. Uh, you can follow Some Like It Classic on Facebook, Insta, and Twitter at Like It Classic. You can follow me on Facebook. I never, I, how long? I still can't memorize this. Facebook and Twitter at Tammy Govea and on Insta at Tammy.Govea. This has been Mimi Pond. Please be sure to follow her, 
support her work, get the word out there about her amazing creative genius talent and join us again next week. (laughs) Join us again next week for another episode of Some Like a Classic. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.